All right, let's get into the word this morning. Um, today, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to be talking about prayer, faith, and healing. Prayer, faith, and healing. I'm not necessarily going to be concentrating on each one of those things too much, but I believe that all three of those things are interrelated and connected with each other. Not only that, over the last several months, or uh, at least definitely a couple of weeks, especially in India, I believe there are more people praying in India than ever before, at least more Christians praying than ever before. Uh, you see more posts about praying, more, more posts about, uh, uh, you know, uh, God healing our land, God healing our physical bodies, and all of these things are going on, and there are a lot of questions that people are having as well. Questions about the role of prayer, questions about why does God heal heal few and does not heal few, or at least they think that God heals a few and does not heal a few. Uh, questions about unanswered prayers. Questions about why is it that even after so many people have been praying about this person or praying about this family or praying about our nation, why haven't things changed? And so I'm going to uh, kind of give you cer certain thoughts that I believe will help you uh, uh, in having a better biblical understanding of what is happening in the world out there right now and also help you align yourself with the Word of God so that you still can experience victory in your life. Amen? And so with that being said, let's go to John chapter 15 and verse 7. John chapter 15 and verse 7. I'll read it from the Amplified first. It says, if you live in me and my words remain in you and continue to live in your hearts, ask whatever you will and it shall be done for you. I'll read it from the New Living Translation. It says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now, that second part of that verse, you may ask anything you want and it will be granted. Now, that's a, an amazing portion of scripture. In fact, that's how we see prayer. That's how uh, um, you know, if you can ask a child, you can ask an old person, you can ask uh, a person that belongs to any kind of religion or faith, you can ask a, 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 even an atheist, and they would say, if there is such a thing as prayer, then I would want it to be a, a, a formula, uh, so to speak, where I can ask for anything, and it will be granted. I can ask for anything, and it will be done unto me. All right? And even though that is the way we think about prayer, and even though we see that in the scripture, we also have to make sure that we understand the sentence that is the prerequisite for that to happen. The sentence that is found uh, uh, in the same verse. Again, John chapter 15 and verse 7. It says, but if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Now, the, it starts off by saying, but if. That means there is a condition that needs to be paid attention to in order for the second part of that verse to come to pass in our lives. And what is that condition? He says, if you remain in me, that means as a child of God, that you remain in God or that your life is in God. That everything that you do, the way you think, act, behave, live the course of your life, it is being done in God. All right. Now, every one of us has to understand that as a born again child of God, as a person who places their faith in Christ Jesus, you are already in God. You are in Christ Jesus, which means in the spirit you are in God and you're in Christ. But now in the soul and in the body, you need to let what is happening in the spirit ooze out of your soul or you need to start living that out in your everyday life. And then he says, and my words remain in you. So there's, there's a two-part uh, uh, equation. Number one, that you stay in God, that you remain in God. But number two, that God's word now remains in you. Not just visits you from time to time, not just during the Sunday sermon and then forget about it, but that the word of God remains in you. Now he says, if, if you are living in me and my word is living on the inside of you, he says, you may ask for anything you want. And it will be granted. In other words, it will be given. Now you might say, but pastor, like, ask anything? 
What if I ask for something very selfish? What if I ask for something sinful? See, that's why he started off by saying, if you abide in me or if you dwell in me or if you remain in me and my words remain in you. See, if you are living in God, remaining in God, and if God's word is remaining in you, guess what? You are not going to ask God for selfish things. You are not going to ask God for sinful things. Why? Because his word is remaining in you. So that's the foundation with which he has started. Now, what needs to be understood is this. A lot of times when it comes to prayer, prayer is seen as the answer to all of life's problems, all right? People, you know, something is wrong, you pray. Somebody needs healing, you pray. Somebody, uh, uh, um, you know, something is wrong in your relationships, you pray. You need an answer, you pray. And, and, and prayer is, the, is seen like the answer to every problem in life. And prayer is actually seen like our last resort. We've lost all hope. Uh, the doctors can't do anything about it. The banker can't do anything about it. Your spouse can't do anything about it. Your parents can't do anything about it because everybody cannot do anything about it. Now you see prayer as the last option. And you go before God and you start praying. However, it is very important to understand that we don't elevate prayer to a place that God has not given it. All right? Don't elevate prayer to a place that God has not given it. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we have to understand that no matter what you are facing in life, prayer is not the answer, but Jesus is the answer. All right? Jesus is the answer. Now, when I say Jesus is the answer, I can also say the Word is the answer. The Word of God is the answer. Why? Because Jesus is the Word becoming flesh. Jesus and the Word are one and the same. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The book of John lets us know that. So the Word is the answer. Jesus is the answer for all of life's problems, for all of life's situations. However, prayer is not the answer. And you cannot replace the place that the Word has or Jesus has with prayer. I hope I'm making sense to you. Now, prayer, however, is a very important thing in the life of a believer. All right? Prayer is very important in the life of a believer. Now, Jesus talked about prayer. The apostle uh, uh, Paul talks about prayer. The disciples talk about prayer. Even in the Old Covenant, we see the importance of prayer. But now, you have to understand, when you look at prayer as the only lifeline that you've got, you're already starting your prayer from the wrong foundation. And it's very important to understand that we start praying from the right foundation, which is the Word of God. So I'll say that again. Don't elevate prayer to a place that is not given by God. All right? The number one place has to be for the Word, and then following the Word. Once the Word is in place, now you bring in prayer into your life. All right? Now, go with me to 1 John chapter 5, please. 1 John chapter Five. Now, when I talk about, again, wh when I say those, make those statements, I'm not uh, talking about you just going before God and, and before you go to bed saying, God, this is the day that I had and, you know, these are the things that I would like to see happen. I'm not talking about those kinds of prayers. I'm talking about prayers where you are facing a situation in your life. You need answers. You need results. You need solutions. In those situations, I'm saying the foundation absolutely has to be the Word of God. All right. First John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 and starting from verse 14. It says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. Again, this is the, uh, 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 from the first book of John, and again, a very important and encouraging scripture from the Bible regarding receiving answers to our prayers. Again, a lot of people have questions. What happened to the prayers that I've prayed? What happened to the prayers that all of these people prayed? Again, look at what it says. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. So he's not talking about a fearful prayer. 
He's not talking about a doubt-filled prayer. He's not talking about a tear-filled prayer, even though there's nothing wrong with tears roll, rolling down your uh, face when you're praying. All right, But he says there is a confidence that we have in God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Meaning he's not saying this is the confidence that we have in God, that no matter what is going on, we just, you know, out of our emotions, we just keep blabbing and blabbing and blabbing our mouths and he hears us and he answers answers us. That's not what he said. He said the confidence is in the fact that you are praying according to the word. And because you're praying according to the word, he says, I've got this confidence that he hears me. And because he hears me, I know that it has been granted to me or that it has been given to me. Hallelujah. Now, this is the confidence. Now, three things that I want you to understand, three steps that I want you to write down if you're taking notes. Number one, whenever you are praying about something, always start with find out the will of God in his word. Step number one, find out the will of God in his word. Now, what did I not say? I did not say find the will of God in your prayer. I'm saying you've got to do this before you pray. Find the will of God in his word. I also did not say find the will of God in your dreams. I did not say find the will of God in your visions or while you sleep at night. No, start by opening the Bible. Find the will of God in his word. Step number two, pray the found will of God. Pray the found will of God. Where did you find the will of God? In his word. So once you know the, his will regarding healing, once you know his will regarding restoration, once you know his will regarding forgiveness, once you know regarding your life being blessed, once you know the will of God regarding these things, then you begin to pray that will in your life. And then number three, be confident and receive. Be confident and receive. Why, why can you be confident? Is this a confidence that you just try to muster up in yourself and say, I'm just confident, I'm just confident, I'm just confident because uh, I, I tithed last month, so I'm, just, uh, I'm confident. I, I, I uh, helped the homeless people last month, so I'm just confident. I, I attended prayer five times last week, so I'm confident. No, it has nothing to do with any of our works. Our confidence simply comes from the fact that we are aligning our lives with the will of God. We are aligning our lives with the word of God. So every single time you pray, when you pray knowing the will of God, you can be sure that he hears you. Hallelujah. And when you know that he hears you, you know it has been granted unto you. Right? This is something that is very important and something that all of us need to understand. Now, however, we also have to understand that when it comes to prayer, there are two types of prayers that God cannot answer. Two types of prayers that God cannot answer. Number one, trying to get God to do what he has already done. Trying to get God to do what he has already done. What do I mean by this? Now, um, for example, let's start off with salvation because, uh, uh, you know, it'll make sense to many of you. When you heard the gospel for the first time, when somebody told you Jesus died on the cross for you, he took care of your sins, he, for has, he has forgiven you, and now you can receive the free gift of salvation. What happened? You found out the will of God, and then you began to pray. When you prayed, you did not start by saying, God, please save me. God, please save me. God, please save me. It's not like you started crying and crying and crying and, and shouted and shouted and repeated and repeated and repeated yourself saying, God, please save me. That's not how you got saved. You got saved knowing what he has done for you. So how do you receive answer to the prayer of salvation? Not by saying, God, please save me. God, please save me. God, please save me. You get the result by knowing the will of God. What is the will of God? You came to know about it through the gospel. That Jesus died on the cross for you. That he for has forgiven you. That he has taken care of your sin. And that when you place your faith in him, that you can receive a new life. Now, when you believe that, you said, God, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I thank you, Jesus, that you've taken my sins away forever. I repent and I receive of your love and your forgiveness in my life. 
Thank you for making me new. And when you prayed that, you became a new creation. You received the answer to that prayer. But understand this, before you ever prayed, it was already done unto you. Are you understanding that? Now, in the same way, even though we understand that about salvation, there are a lot of people right now who are asking God to heal them. God, please heal me. God, please heal my sister. God, please heal my brother. God, please heal my wife. God, please heal my father, my mother. And we keep saying this. And after we say it two, three times, and if nothing happens, now we start crying about it. And now we get two or three people to add on to our crying. And then we spread the news on what's happened on social media to get a thousand people to cry about it, a thousand people to pray about it. But again, in doing so, we are still not understanding the will of God and not praying according to the will of God. See, when you keep asking God to heal, you're either ignorant of what God has already said, or you are choosing not to believe what he has already said. Now, what is it that he has already said in his word? He has already said in his word that he took your sickness and your disease. He took your infirmities on the cross, just like he took your sins away. And when you understand that he took them, you also understand that by his wounds, we are healed. That's the word of the Lord. Now, if you keep saying, God healed me, God saved me, God bless me, there's nothing that God can do to answer those prayers. Why? Because he has already blessed you. He has already healed you. He has already saved you. And he has already forgiven you. So you say, God bless me. And God says, I, it's already done. I already did. What more do you want me to do? So whenever you're praying, and if you're asking God to do something that he has already done, that's a prayer that God cannot answer. Number two, asking God to do what he has told you to do. Asking God to do what he has told you you to do. Now, a lot of times, again, let, let's just take what's happening in the world right now. There are a lot of people who keep praying and saying, God, please stop the coronavirus. God, please stop the attack of the enemy. God, please remove the devil from India. God, please remove this disease from India. Right? Again, what are we asking God to do? We're asking God to do something that he has already done something about and that he has already told us to do something about. Number one, when he died on the cross and when he rose again from the dead, the Bible says that he destroyed the works of the enemy. Now, after destroying the works of the enemy, now he is given a responsibility to the church, which means the body of Christ, which is you and I, everybody that's a Christian. I'm talking to you right now. God has given us a responsibility. Now, for example, Jesus, after the resurrection, uh, 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 towards the end of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will see where he says, now you go in my name. And he says, you cast out the devils. He says, you heal the sick. He says, you raise the dead and, 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 and have people uh, filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. He's giving us the responsibility. Meaning what? Meaning God has done something about the devil and God has given us a responsibility in terms of the devil or in regards to the devil. Now you come to Peter. Peter says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, please understand... Peter is not saying, whenever you're in trouble, get on your knees and start begging God and God will come down from heaven and he will throw the enemy away. He doesn't say that. However, we pray that way. Many people pray and saying, God, do something about, remove the corona. God, have mercy. God, have mercy. God, have mercy. As if God doesn't have mercy for India. God, please, where is your grace? Show us your grace. As if God is not showing his grace. What do we think is happening? Oh, God, mercy, mercy on India, mercy on India, mercy on India. Do you think like God is just busy with his work and all of a sudden, like some kind of siren goes off in heaven because, oh, a, thou a million people said mercy a million times. Oh, okay, okay, I completely forgot about mercy. All of a sudden, like it's like a reminder for God. 
Oh, I forgot about showing mercy to India. Let me pour some mercy on India now. And do you think like he heaven's going to just pour it out and, and mercy is going to fall on India all of a sudden? Because a million people kept crying out and saying, God show us mercy, God show us mercy. It's not. That's not how it happens. God has been merciful to India. He is merciful to India. He will continue to be merciful to India. That's the nature and the character of God. That's the God we serve. He has been gracious. He is gracious and he will be gracious. Are you understanding that? See, so we have to understand our responsibility. We have to understand God, through Jesus Christ, has destroyed the works of the enemy. So what do you and I do about it? We have to walk in the authority given to us. Understanding the responsibility that has been placed on our lives. Now, go with me to, uh, again, let me say this, and if you're taking notes, write this down. The reason why we pray this way is number one, is either you are ignorant of the word of God, or number two, you don't believe what the word says. <clears throat> We're either ignorant of the word of God, or we don't believe what the word says. Go with me to Mark chapter 11. Mark 11 and starting from verse 22. It says, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be thou cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things which he says will be done. He will have whatever he says. Verse 24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now think about, I mean, I know many of you have read this over and over again, but think about it like you're reading it for the very first time. This is not the idea of a, of a, uh, of a theologian or of a well-known pastor. These are the words of Jesus himself. And look at what he's saying. The disciples are with him. He curses a fig tree the earlier day, uh, the, the previous day, sorry. And then on this particular day, when they're walking past, Peter sees that the tree that Jesus cursed has completely withered away from its very roots, the Bible tells us. And so he's astonished at it because Peter never saw anyone speak to a tree and the tree be affected by the words that that person spoke. So he's amazed. He's astonished. He's never seen this kind of authority. And all of a sudden, Jesus now responds and he says, have faith in God. He starts off with that foundation. Have faith in God. Meaning, no longer limit yourself to what you know by the world's standard. Have faith in God. Understand that everything that you thought was impossible has now already become possible possible because God has been included in the equation. Have faith in God, which means anything and everything that is not possible by human understanding and by the laws of nature is now all of a sudden possible. And now he says, if you say unto this mountain, like I spoke to this tree, and if you tell that mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and he says, if you don't doubt it in your heart, you will have what you say. Why? Because you believe in what you say. See, when Jesus spoke to the fig tree, he was walking in authority, but he believed in that authority. He believed in the words that he was speaking. So he believed and he kept walking, not waiting for the results. Because he knew once spoken, it was bound to happen. Now, he's not talking about prayer. He's talking about walking in authority. Remember, I said we're going to talk about prayer, faith, and healing. So we talked about prayer, and I said that the most important thing that you can learn for, for today is prayer always begins with the Word. Prayer always begins with knowing the will of God. Now, once you know the will of God, that's where faith begins. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith begins where the will of God is known. So when you know the will of God, you've got faith, and now you pray. Not only do you pray, but now you walk in authority. 
the God given authority. And so now Jesus is talking about authority, but now in verse 24, he comes back to talk about prayer and he says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now that word receive means to take. So read it this way. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you take them and you will have them. Take them. There are certain things that God has given to you, but the enemy is doing everything that he can to hold them back from you. It's time for you to take them. It's time for you to take your healing. It's time for you to take your peace. It's time for you to take your joy, take your wholeness, take your forgiveness, take your restoration, take your freedom, take your redemption today. God is not waiting Sorry, you are not waiting on God. God is waiting on us. Take by faith. Take it in the spirit. What happens when you take it by faith? What happens when you take it in the spirit? He says, and then you will have them. So first you've got to take it in the spirit. Take it in your heart. Take it by faith and you will have them. You will take possession of them in the flesh, in the natural. But you've got to take possession in the spirit. You've got to take possession in the spirit. See, again, so why is it that we're not happening? Again, just think about the, over the last few weeks, okay? Just do this experiment. Over the last several weeks, all the prayers that you have seen being prayed by various people, all the prayers that you have seen in your family WhatsApp groups, all the prayers that you have seen in your Christian work groups or wherever on Facebook and all of these places, how many people have been praying with the posture of a beggar versus how many people have been praying with the posture of a son or child of God that is made in the new creation? You just, you just examine that. Just examine that. Just go through your text messages, go on social media, and all the prayers that you've seen. How many people are praying from the, a perspective of a beggar, begging for mercy, begging for grace, begging for healing, versus the number of people who are praying in the God-given authority? It is not arrogance, it is humility. It is arrogant. To beg when God tells you to command. It is arrogant to keep asking God for the same things he has already given. It is humility to say, God, I'm not asking. I am taking by faith because of what you have given to me. That's humility, my friend. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you in due time. Casting all your cares on him and he care, because he cares for you. And what do most of us do? We carry the load. Go, oh God, please help me. This is becoming too much. I'm carrying too much. It's becoming heavy. It's becoming heavy. God, please show mercy. Please show mercy. What are we telling God when we keep begging for mercy? Somewhere in our hearts, we believe God is not merciful. Somewhere in our hearts, we're thinking that God is not showing mercy. Somewhere in our hearts, we think we actually have more love for our nation, more love for the people that are suffering than God himself. And it's almost like, okay, let me give God, I, I think he's too busy. I think problems, maybe a union problem with the angels right now, and maybe some uh, economic problems in heaven. So let me just remind God, okay? I'll send him a friendly reminder. God, this is me. Please, please show some mercy. Please show some grace. Please be merciful to the people. Please understand so many are dying. Please understand so many are suffering. Please do something. Please do something. Please do something about it. Now, why would we pray that way? It's either because we're ignorant of the word, or number two, we simply don't believe. We simply don't believe. Look at the authority that has been given to us. How is it, why is it that many of us still beg when we've been given authority? 
when we have been given sonship in the kingdom. We belong to the family of God. The family of God. I mean, what would it look like you come to my house and I say, hey, we're going to have dinner. You're, you're welcome to come. And all of you guys come and we're about to have dinner. And, and, and you see all of a sudden my two daughters coming to me in fear. And they're wondering if they can reach to me or if they should not reach to me. If they can speak to me or not speak to me. And finally, when they muster up enough courage to speak to me, they, they come to me and say, Dad, can we please have some food? Can we please have some food? Can I just have one, 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 one uh, uh, piece of candy? One, just, just one, just one. Please, Dad, please, Dad, please think of me. Please don't forget that I'm hungry. Please don't forget that I also need to eat and not just all of these people. If you see my daughters coming to me and speaking that way, what would you think of me? What would you think of me? Do you think, do, 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 do we think we're better fathers than God, our father? If somebody who's at the party comes to me and says, hey, please don't forget your children. Do something about your children. Please don't forget to feed your children. I mean, that would be an insult to me. Why are you coming and telling me not to forget to feed my children? Are you understanding? I, I, I hope I'm making sense to you. And yet, why is it that we pray that way? Genuinely ask yourself that question today. Take a moment and, and, and even after this message is done, say, just ask yourself that question. Why do I pray the way I pray? Why do I pray the way I pray? Is it because I just saw other people pray that way and therefore I'll just repeat it like a parrot? Is it because I just saw my father pray that way, my mother pray that way, my pastor pray that way, or whatever it is? Right? I, I, I just saw this forwarded message on WhatsApp and I saw the prayer. I thought it's a good prayer and I just forwarded and now I keep praying the same way. Why do you pray the way you pray? And if the answer is anything but, I pray because of what I see in the new covenant. Then it's the wrong answer. It's the wrong answer. The only right answer to Praying the way you pray is, I pray this way because of what Jesus has done for me and what he said is possible for me in the new covenant that he made by his blood. Don't show some psalm that, that where, where David is lamenting in pain and say, I'm going to pray that way. Think about all the things David did not have. Think about all the things you have. Again, let, let, let's take the example of my daughters. My daughters are blessed. All their needs are met. They, they're not worried about daily food. But now, there are a lot of people in this world that don't have daily food. Now, if they see somebody like that write a poem talking about, I just wish I had enough food to eat today. And if my daughters keep singing that song or keep reading that poem to me, it will be stupid. Why? Because their experience is not the same. And what has been given to them is much greater than what the other people have. And we've got to understand what Jesus has done for us. We've got to understand what has been given to us. David did not have the authority that you and I have. David did not have the precious blood of Jesus spilled for him the way you and I have. Jesus, David did not have the precious word of God the way you and I have. David did not have the Holy Spirit given to him the way you and I have. 
Now, after having all of these advantages, for us to go back and cry, like David did, would be absolutely foolish. Think about what Christ has done. Pray in line with that. Walk, walk in line with that. Go with, excuse me, go with me to Matthew chapter 8, please. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16. It says, when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. He did two things. Cast out demons, heal the sick. How did he do that? He didn't do it by prayer. He didn't do it by finding out the will of God and saying, Father, do you want some of these demons staying here? Do you want all of the demons to be cast out? He didn't ask the father and say, do you want all of them to be healed? Or do you want me to leave some of them in their sickness and disease so that you can continue to teach them something? So that you can continue to get the glory out of this sickness? No, he doesn't ask the father. Why? Because he knows the will of the father. And what is the will of the father? What is the will of God? Cast every single demon out. What is the will of the Father? To heal some and not heal some? No. Heal every single person. That's why he never asks. Why is it that we still have people who pray and say, God, if it is your will, please heal my grandfather. God, if it is your will, please heal my son. God, if it is your will, heal somebody else. Why? Why do you pray the way you pray? You don't see Jesus doing that. Jesus is not asking. Now, how did he do it? Read carefully. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. How did he cast them out? With a word. How did he heal the sick? With a word. So how do you and I do it? With the word. With the word. Not Praying so that we change the heart of God towards our situation. We do it through the word. He did it through the word. Every single time. All the time. The word is the answer for all of us. Now, go with me to Mark chapter 5, please. Mark chapter 5. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. Again, a, a well-known portion of scripture, but I want you to pay attention to this. Mark chapter 5 and starting from verse 25. He said, now a certain um, woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said... If I only, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Verse 29. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitudes thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of all your affliction. Be healed of all your affliction. Now this woman has been suffering for years. Not just suffering in her physical body, but she has now suffering financially because the Bible says that she spent all that she had and she only grew worse. Which means she was not in a place where she could keep making more money. And in that kind of place, 
a place of disappointment a place of hopelessness she took a bold step of faith now the bible doesn't say that she approached jesus crying the bible doesn't say that she approached jesus begging in fact this was a what you would call a violent act of faith she didn't ask for permission she didn't consult other people all she knew was that she's been suffering for all of these years she knew that what she wanted could be found in jesus she knew that he was the answer to her problem and how did she know that the bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so i've got to assume even though it's not written in the word i've got to assume she heard the good news about jesus she heard that there is this man called jesus and he heals the sick there's a man called jesus that he he heals not not only a few people that he heals everybody who believes in him and so she comes and i know she came in faith because in verse 28 she says for she said if i may only touch the touch his clothes i shall be made well now the bible tells us that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks see nobody told her this has to be your confession but the bible says that she kept saying it if i can touch his clothes if i can touch his clothes i will be made well if i can touch his clothes i will be made well if i can touch his clothes i know i will be made well i know i will be made well i know he is the answer to my life i know he is the answer to this sickness i know he is the answer for all my problems i know he is the answer to be me be me being made whole in my life i know and so she kept saying her heart was filled with this good news filled with faith and she goes but when she goes she touches the bible says virtue left jesus and she was immediately healed now jesus asks in verse 30 he says who touched my clothes who touched me now why is he asking that question is he upset is he angry is he saying who who in there who who has the authority who took healing without my permission from me he's not angry like somebody stole something from him he's not saying how can you take healing without me asking god if it is his will to heal you or not because according to what some of us believe we think god likes to heal you God doesn't like to heal a few. But that's not what's on Jesus' mind. He looks when he finds he says, "Daughter," verse 34, "your faith has made you well." Your faith has made you well. See Mark 11:24, when you pray, believe that you take it. believe that you receive it and you will have it see even when this was happening jesus did not die on the cross yet this is in the old testament this is the old covenant i know it's in the book of mark but it's in the old covenant because covenant is when jesus dies on the cross and he rises again from the dead that's the new covenant that's when the real new testament begins that's why the bible says the new covenant in the blood that was made by the blood of jesus well the blood of jesus was only shed at the cross so that's where the new covenant begins so technically this in all reality took place in the old testament now you're seeing a woman who goes and violently takes something that is offered by God. Oh in the New Testament. Here's what I want you to know. 
as we talk about prayer, faith, and healing, when it comes to healing, don't keep begging God to heal you. Pastor, what do I do? Remember what I said. Find out the will of God in His Word. And then I said, pray the will of God that you found. So in this case, once you know it is God's will to heal you and that He has healed you, you declare out of your mouth that you are healed of the Lord. And then step number three, be confident and receive your healing. Know that it is God's will to heal you. Know that you have been healed by God at the cross of Calvary. Declare that out of your mouth and receive your healing boldly. Receive your healing by faith. Don't keep begging God to do something that he has already done for you. He says, by his wounds we are healed. Hallelujah. The precious blood of Jesus the precious body of Jesus.